Welcome to the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel. We're so glad that you are watching this virtual author event. We have a full house today. Um, my name is Annie. I am the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn, which is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're familiar with us. Uh, if you've been to one of our author events in person or online before, welcome back. If it's your first time, thank you for being here. Thanks for watching independent bookstore events, even uh, even in virtual form. We're super excited to have a conversation today between authors Peace Medea and Leila Alamar. And we are also going to be hearing a little bit from Kurt Rhodes from the organization Quest Scope. So first we're going to hear from Kurt, then Peace and Layla will discuss her book, Silence is a Sense, and we will be taking a few questions at the end. If you have a question at any point during the broadcast, please ask it via the comments. If you're watching on Facebook, that's through the comments under the video. If you're watching on YouTube, it's through the live chat on the side of the screen. You can ask at any time and we will go through questions at the end. However, you can also just reach into the chat and say hello, tell us where you're watching from. Um, both Layla and Peace are um, overseas in broadcasting from England, so we thank them for doing this uh, in the middle of the night practically, uh, so thanks for being here. Um, and if you have anyone who's missed the event live and would like to watch it some other time, these videos do remain available on the Majors and Quinn Facebook videos page and YouTube channel. So once again, thank you for being here. And I am going to bring Kurt up to your screens and he's going to tell you a little bit about an organization called Questscope and the work that they do. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's really a privilege to be here, especially to be able to share some of the story of Layla. Um, Questcope was birthed in 1982 in Beirut, Lebanon, when I was a professor at the American University of Beirut and in the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health. And I um, was present during the time of the massacre of Palestinian civilians in the Sabra and Shatila camps, which really changed the direction of my life and brought Questcope into being, gave us our motto of putting the last first, and I, I want to describe how important what Layla is going to be telling us is in the lives of people who've experienced trauma. Um, as a young Iraqi refugee in Jordan a number of years ago, the young girl I'm going to tell you about was eight years old at the time, but the trauma had happened to her when she was three. She had been kidnapped, held for ransom, and and her parents had been informed that she would not be returned to them unless they paid a $5,000 price to get her back. So like any parent would do, the parents sold everything they had, they borrowed everything that they could borrow, they made, uh, did any kind of thing they could to put together the price. And three days later, their daughter was rolled out of a car, um, tied up and gagged. And her, I think her two, two front teeth had been knocked out. She hadn't been fed or given water for those three days. They immediately left Iraq and came to Jordan. And from that time for the next five years, the little girl never spoke. If she really needed something, she would whisper softly into her mother's ears. But it was really, um, basically she was taking refuge in silence. And that refuge also becomes a kind of prison, but it's also a refuge. Um, in a workshop, series of workshops that we had in Aqaba, Jordan, when the, uh, the mother of the little girl attended, she came also. And <clears throat> there was really, uh, during, Workshops were not designed for children, so we had one of our female staff spend some time with her. And of course, the little girl is, doesn't speak, but it was clear that she could hear and understand. So our staff woman realized that 
she, the little girl kept looking at her nails. She had had done her nails as French nails. And so she asked her, she said, would you like to have nails like this? And the little girl nodded. So apparently it takes a long time to do French nails. So in the next hour or so, when they were filing and cutting and polishing and holding each other's hands, the little girl began to speak for the first time. I just, I think that's so significant because there was no, no one was trying to get her to do anything or to talk. We were actually responding to something that she wanted in the way that she wanted. And part of that was the human touch. So this, this book that Layla has written and the experiences that she's expressed are really vital to enter in with her and understand um, the, both the trauma, the effects of it, and some of the ways that people can be healed. So thank you for allowing me to uh, prepare your hearts and minds for what Layla and Peace will have to say as they share in front of us uh, their, the words that they would like to communicate. Thank you very much. Now to Peace. Thank you, thank you, Kurt, for that introduction um, to Leila's work. I'm really excited to be joining Leila today to discuss her book. Um, and before we get into the conversation, I want to introduce Leila. Um, Leila Aloma is a writer and academic from Kuwait. She has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Edinburgh. Her short stories have appeared in the Evening Standard. Quill Bell Magazine, The Red Letters, St. Andrew's Prose Journal, and Aesthetica Magazine, where her story, The Lagoon, was a finalist for the 2014 Creative Writing Award. She was the 2018 British Council International Writer in Residence at the Small Wonder Short Story Festival. Her debut novel, The Pact We Made, was published in 2019. She has written for The Guardian and Arab Lit Quarterly. She is currently pursuing a PhD on the intersection of Arab women's fiction and literary trauma theory. So, wherever you are, join me in welcoming Leila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peace. And uh, thank you, Kurt, for that uh, very moving uh, story and to Majors and Quinn for hosting me um, and my new novel. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say, Leila, I, I so very much enjoyed reading your book. It is powerful, it is important, it is insightful, it is so lyrical. Um, and there's a lot to learn. But as a reader, I would confess that I just love a good story, mm. right? And it's very yeah. important that you're reading a book and you just, you, you get so invested you grow, you grow attached to the characters and you want to know what happens to them. So put everything aside, putting aside the importance of the book and the, you know, the timeliness of the book is just a great read. Um, so congratulations on, on you. an amazing job. Thank you so much. That really means a lot. You know, so often uh, our, our books, you know, when we're, when we're women who are writing from marginalized uh, communities, so often our books are taken solely for their ethnographic value, you know, and for what they can reveal and, and you know, uh, educate and inform, you know, and, and the craft sometimes gets pushed aside and, and the fact of it just being literature and just, just being um, appreciated for, for the craft uh doesn't happen very often so i really appreciate that thank you great um so you're gonna read a short uh portion but before yeah. you go, i'll ask you to just tell us a bit about your book and then mm -hmm. get into the reading sure yeah so um silence is a sense uh is about a young woman uh, she's a Syrian refugee who has fled her homeland after the Arab Spring uprisings there in early 2011, very quickly descended into civil war. And she's made her way across Europe on this very harrowing journey. And 
And when we meet her in the present day narrative, she's living in an English city. Um, and so she, she's she been traumatized into muteness um, by her experiences. And so she's very isolated and disconnected. And she watches her neighbors through the windows and she writes for an online magazine about her experiences. And these are all ways for her to try and cope with her with her traumas and, and process them in some way. Uh, so the part that I'm going to read comes a bit later in the novel. Uh, and it's a scene that the protagonist, who is unnamed, so we'll just annoyingly call her the protagonist, um, she kind of revisits this scene throughout the book. And there's kind of a core kernel of, of trauma and truth in this scene, which concerns her participation in the protests back home with her friends and her love interest, Khaled. Um, and so there's a there's a core of trauma there that she she can't quite touch and she can't quite articulate, so she just circles it. And so essentially the same scene appears three times in the novel in three different iterations. So the first time it's it's quite direct, but the reader feels like there's something off, something a bit surreal to it. Um, the second time they're presented as puppets in a theater show. And then the third time is the one that I'm going to read, which is where the scene really turns kind of hellish and nightmarish. Um, and, and the chapter is called The Eye. The cell is limbed in red. Hazy, a fine metallic mist hangs in the air, latching itself to the tongue and sliding down a clenched throat. A blood drop sun pulses in the sky. Its rays burn like acid, like gas, like the chemicals he swears he isn't using. Look around, everything is red. The aluminum desks, the white tiled floor, the yellow sponge spilling out of the cracks in the leather chairs, it is all bathed in a heavy maroon glow. No matter how hard I scrub, the window pane will not let in anything but red, red rays. This cell is bordered in ox blood, in burning embers, like a smoldering fire pit. The cell, the word, the concept, looms large in our imaginations. Room, house, prison, country, all of themselves. All these places where you are watched and heard and monitored. The only safe space is the one between your ears or in the grave. Usama and Amr have blood on their faces and they labor over a fabric that matches. They move their markers over the cotton in silence, nothing to hear but the scratch as the tip traverses the surface, painting it in heavy helmeted thugs with stern mouths and tanks crushed by flowers and birds soaring over water wheels. Death before humiliation, death before humiliation, Death before humiliation is repeated a hundred million times in a hundred million ways. We are trying to tell you that there are worse things than dying. High in the corner, the eye watches us. Like every other time and in every other place, it watches us. The veins are more prominent today. Bulging red veins that beat to a soundless rhythm. Back and forth, back and forth no brain behind to interpret what it sees. The huddle is gone this time. It's only Osama and Amr bent over the desks, me by the windows and Khalid against the wall, his gaze moving between the eye, the painting of the fabric and the dead world outside. He's in a beige jumpsuit, a white helmet dangling from his fingertips and he looks more tired than there are words for. Do you know they call you a liar now, my love? A propagandist, a terrorist even? Terror. Terror is no longer the one-two explosion of barrel bombs or the pop of gunfire or the knock on the door. No, we have redefined it. Terror is the silence between explosions. 
the quiet before the knock on the door, before the bullet hits its target and you can breathe again because this time it wasn't you. We are breathing because outside the bombs have not stopped falling. We inhale one and exhale the other. It's like thunder behind the eyes, like a thousand drums beating in your chest, like the walls of existence are collapsing all around you all at once. It is like no sound you've heard before. It's done, says Amr, straightening up and cracking his back. Osama concurs with a nod and answering crack of his neck. Yalla! We, the three of us, roll up the fabric until it's a thick scroll. We carry it to the open windows. I turn to ask Khaled to join us, but he's under the eye now, inspecting it, reaching up with hesitant hands to poke at it as though it might bite, and my breath catches in my lungs. Yalla, Osama says again, prodding me to release my end of the fabric. We let go, and the cotton unfurls down the side of the building. It's met with silence a silence so complete it seems to have swallowed the world. The banner flaps and slaps against the wall, dripping red and black onto the empty street below. The wind catches it, ripping the fabric from our hands and sending it flying over the buildings. The heavy thugs and tanks detach, inky blobs fall to the pavement without a sound. The flowers burst forth into color and the water wheels and birds go spinning and screaming into the sky. Behind us, there's a crash. Khaled is attacking the eye with his helmet. My heart stops as he hammers at it. Furious, desperate, it drowns out any and all other sounds. Bashing and bashing, he lets out short grunts and yips and what sound like whimpers until the eye cracks and splinters and is ripped from the ceiling to lie in a broken heap at his feet. He's sweaty, jaw locked in a grimace, panting like a feral animal, like the wolf they've turned him into. Is this victory or just another kind of death? Thank you. Thank you. That is uh, such a perfect uh, selection. I remember reading and thinking that you do such a wonderful job of describing violence, traumatic situations, difficult situations, but in a way that the reader does, does not necessarily always catch it the first time. Um, and there are just so many ways in which you describe these really difficult situations um, mm -hmm. that the narrator goes through, but various people also go through, but using different kinds of words and images. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself is it's, it's so innovative and it's what makes it such a, an interesting novel to read. Thank you. Yeah, l language is very important in this, in this story, um, both Arabic and English. And uh, in the writing of it, I did want to have these different layers and different undercurrents that, that people might pick up on you know, if they if they understand Arabic, they might pick up on certain uh, cues and certain uh, you know little tell telling signs in the text that an English speaker may not necessarily pick up on. But then there were other layers um, uh, and and recurrent images and themes um, that kind of are meant to build as you go through the text, as you go through the story. Mm -hmm. Where, where did this story come from? Why did you want to write this story? Uh, you know, uh, I'm not the kind of person who sets out to write a specific novel. Um, I don't sit and think, you know, this would be a good topic to write a novel about. Um, I just, I get a voice in my head and I, I follow the voice along and, and see what who that character is and what their story is. Um, but the underlying themes of the novel, so the Arab Spring, uh, the Civil War, the refugee crisis, the rise of alt-right rhetoric, nationalist rhetoric, um, anti-Muslim sentiment, these are things that I had been following uh, for the better part of the decade. You know, the, the Arab Spring kicked off in, in late 2010, early 2011, 
I was living in Kuwait at the time, which is where I'm from. Uh, and, and so we were all really kind of caught up in this surge of emotion and this, this movement that swept right across the region. Um, and, and it was something that we followed, you know, up until now, you know, the, the latest uh, protest, it's still ongoing. It's, the struggle is, is not over by any means. Um, and then when the situation in Syria devolved into civil war, we were all watching that and following it and, you know, the ensuing refugee crisis. So these were all um, anxieties and issues that I was very much brooding over and that were troubling me for, for like I say, the better part of the decade. Um, and so when I got this voice for, for this character, um, it just, th this, is, this is where the story was and it just came out in this vein. And it's something that stood out to me was, and I don't know if, if you intended this, but the issue of distance. Mm. It felt like our protagonist, there was this gap, this gulf between her and everyone else. Mm. And so I live in the UK. Um, I don't come from the UK. I moved here recently, but I've remembered Oh, I, I felt over time that it can be difficult as someone not from this country coming here and, mm -hmm. and um, that it tends to be this distance. And I, so I wondered if that was something that you were trying to communicate with uh, the narrator kind of being a part and observing mm -hmm. everyone around her. But until much later in the novel, she's not really engaging, interacting mm -hmm. with the people around her. Yeah, you know, that was that was intentional because the the voice that I initially got was one where she was just in her flat watching her neighbors through the windows across the way. Uh, and she was she was disconnected and, and she was isolated. And it seemed to me that as a result of her many traumas over the preceding years, uh, she would seek out this isolation and this um of being disconnected from others as a safety mechanism, you know? So, so in being isolated, she could be safe uh, in a physical, literal sense, you know, that if she's boxed in her little flat, then she knows that nothing will happen to her. Um, but also that she would be safe, you know, if, if she doesn't make connections and she doesn't love anyone, she doesn't make friends with anyone, then she won't endure the grief and the loss that she left behind. And so that as well becomes a kind of um, self-preservation uh, instinct for her, where she thinks if, if, if she stays alone and she stays disconnected, then finally she'll be safe. Uh, but of course, you know, as, as the narrative goes on, you know, she realizes that that humans are are social animals and we need each other and and she starts to form these connections with people in the community sometimes against her will um, but it does start to happen and and she starts to to venture out of her flat and and you know move through the community in different ways and trauma and memory are important themes um, mm -hmm. in the book. And um, I was very frustrated with uh, her editor, Josie. <laughs> Josie. Yes, yeah, she kept insisting, like wanting to mine her memory, um, you know, with, with no concern for the trauma, mm -hmm. having someone relive it. Um, and I mean, it's of course very exploitative. And as someone who does research, so I study violence against women. Mm -hmm. Something I've, I've struggled with over time is just interviewing people, yeah, asking them, tell me about this horrible thing that happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I've wondered whether, you know, should we keep researching the same group of people over and over again, people in refugee camps, people in conflict affected countries, yeah. and asking them to relive um, the, the trauma. trauma and not recognizing that sometimes maybe forgetting is just fine yeah. and forgetting is just what people need anyway so i yeah. was wondering what what did you want to communicate about mm -hmm. memory trauma yeah you know there's a number of different 
um, uses, I guess, that, that her relationship with Josie served in the function of, of the novel. Uh, as you said, you know, Josie is wanting to mine these memories and she's doing it for a very specific reason because, you know, she, she is a magazine editor. And so she's approaching this relationship from that set of parameters and that framework. And, and, you know, in the media, we have this learned inbuilt assumption concerning refugees and concerning the narratives that were meant to receive from them or that we think were meant to receive from them. And so Josie is trying to fit uh, the protagonist into that mold because she wants people to click on these articles and read them. Mm -hmm. um, for the protagonist, she, she struggles with that and she struggles with it for a number of reasons, I think. And, and one of them has to do with what, like what you said about, about trauma and memory and the effect that trauma has in, in rupturing um, the mind and in rupturing how memory functions. And uh, I think to a large extent, the, the protagonist doesn't trust her mind anymore. And she doesn't trust her mind to be able to make sense of these memories and put them into a kind of neat, resolvable narrative that Josie wants. Um, and, and so that's that's the nature I think of the struggle between the two of them is is this idea of uh, are you interested in a narrative or are you interested in truth, right? And and narratives are quite we're, we're all used to how we consume narratives. You know, there's a beginning and a middle and an end. It's it's quite neat and and this is the kind of thing that refugees encounter when when they arrive is is, you know, tell me your story in a way that I can understand it, right? But the, the person who's receiving the story is in power. They're, they're empowered because they're dictating that process. And so, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with this novel is, is to try and wrestle back that control and to try and say to the reader, will you stick with this protagonist? Will you stick with her story and let her dictate how it's told rather than how you expect to hear it or how what you expect it to look like. Mm -hmm. Will you let her be in charge of that? And you do that very well uh, because I did stick with her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the hope. That's the hope because, you know, so often we, we are led around by our own assumptions of how uh, and how how these stories should be told, and and are and that leads to assumptions about who these people are, right? Mm -hmm. And and there is a power dynamic there, and there is a power imbalance uh, in that whole process. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that I think that the authority should be with the giver of the story rather than the receiver. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, and I, when I was reading, I was a bit surprised that there were portions that I found to be funny. I just didn't think I would find humor in um, in in you know, a book dealing with such a serious topic. And then yeah. I thought, well, maybe I'm the only one who will find these things funny. Maybe they weren't <laughs> supposed to be funny. I'm not sure not. Observations about people. Um, and and how the things that she, you know how she evaluates what people are doing, even the descriptions that she's offering of people, mm -hmm. and I that is just something it's something with an outsider like looking in on people yeah. and kind of detecting absurdities that the, the locals themselves do not detect are not aware of. So I was wondering, did you intend for there to be some humor, but also mm -hmm. uh, on a broader level, how does one write humor yeah. when with such difficult topics it, it is hard and um i didn't set out to write anything humorous but it was just her voice and the way that she would comment on things yes and and you know her perspective on things and I, and a lot of it is is tongue in cheek i think you know like even even the the name that she gives herself when she's writing the the articles is the voiceless uh, and I think that that's a little bit of a tongue in cheek, you know, sarcastic thing for her to say, because that is so often what we hear when, when we're talking about 
you know, Arab women or Muslim women, it's always like their voice needs to be heard, you know, and it's, it's become kind of a cliche. Uh, and so I think that her choosing that moniker is, is a little bit of a tongue in cheek uh, gesture on her part. Um, and, and yeah, and, and when she's, when she's watching her, her neighbors through the window, she is making these quick snap judgments about them. And sometimes she is sarcastic. Sometimes she is a bit snarky about it. Uh, sometimes she's just straight up judgmental, you know? And I think that that's, I think that there's, there's a freedom in seeing that as well. You know, I, I didn't want to create this grateful immigrant narrative, you know, where she's just perfect and she's, you know, just, uh, you know, she, she sees everything in a nice light. No, she is judgmental and she has her own biases and prejudices that she's she's brought with her, you know, that I think is, is a very human thing. We all have prejudices, you know, it's just a matter of, of locating them and being aware of them uh, rather than denying that they exist because they don't, they exist for everybody. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you do such a wonderful job of just giving us insights into. I mean, I know it's just one, one the experience of one person, a fictional mm. person, but that we just get so much insights into this person's life and like the lived realities of going through this brutal journey. Yeah, of you know, crossing seas and borders and trying to find safety yeah. and not finding um safety as one thought um mm -hmm. fine in in a place like the uk um when you were writing did you have oh did you have a reader in mind or did you have an audience in mind when you're writing this book uh no <laughs> i don't i don't find it helpful to think about an audience just just for the simple reason that there are too many readers to think of that if i'm gonna start thinking about all of the different readers out there I it would paralyze me. I wouldn't I wouldn't write at all. Um, I don't honestly think about the audience until probably too late. Like when the when the book is just about to go out into the world, that's when I'm like, oh, people are gonna actually read this thing. Um, but I, I don't find it productive to think about about the reader. Um, because then you know you get into this, you get into these different debate about representation and about language and and you know there's a lot of arabic in the book there's there's some arabic dialogue there's arabic words um there are things that are referenced which would be familiar to an audience that is familiar with the arab world and the arab context and if i'm thinking that the book is only for an english speaking audience who knows nothing about the context i'm going to over explain and i'm going to gloss my arabic and i'm going to maybe translate it um and then in doing that i'm excluding another audience i'm excluding the audience that is familiar with the arab world and is familiar with these contexts and a bilingual reader like myself you know, who doesn't need the Arabic translated. Well, what about those readers? You know, should they not, should, should the book not be for them? Uh, you know, so I try, I try not to think in those terms and I try to just write the book that feels organic and it feels natural and it feels authentic to me uh, and just hope that it translates across different audiences. Mm. Did, did you do research for the book? Uh, you know, I don't do research during the drafting of, you know, the first draft. I just kind of let the story come out. But then in subsequent drafts, when I'm editing it, I might, I might go and double check things. Um, you know, as I say, these were, these were issues that I was following for, for the better part of the decade. And so I was reading books about the war. I was reading books about the uprisings. I was reading articles about the refugee crisis, watching documentaries and interviews and reading testimonials. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, a refugee from Aleppo, a young man um, down in London. And we subsequently became friends and he was very open and honest about, about his journey across Europe and 
um, and his his settling in the UK. So you know there there were all there was always that material that was there, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a directed research project process where I sat down and said, right, I need to read this, I need to research this book. You know, it was just a natural progression of of all of the reading material and all of the the sources that I had consumed over the preceding years. Um, so so I, I teach about, most of my work is on gender and I teach about uh, gender and migration and the refugee experience. Um, and I you know, talk to my students a lot about how the experiences of you know, women fleeing violence you know, differs mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. Uh, between the experiences of men and women and i think you know your work is really able to kind of open that box and show us you know the unique experience at least of one woman mm. and, and what she went through and as i was reading i thought this is a book i want my students to read um and this is a book that i would love to see on syllabi or people teaching about human rights and refugees and migration um, so I'm definitely going to be recommending it to all of my um, uh, social scientist friends who, who work on this issue. Um, that means a lot. Thank you. You're dealing with very difficult, difficult subjects. And I wondered, how, how do you handle um, writing them? So I, my work is about sexual violence quite a bit. Mm. And I spent a lot of time speaking to women who had experienced sexual violence. Yeah. And it was so difficult. And it's partly why I wrote the kind of novel that I wrote mm -hmm. and why I said, I'm not, I decided not to write about violence in my novel just because it's really difficult. Yeah. We're talking about reading this material, talking to people who, or at least to one person who's experienced um, such a difficult um, experience. Um, so I, I wondered how do you how do you deal with it um, or do you deal with it basically? <laughs> uh, it's difficult, um, and there were certainly parts of this novel when I was writing it um, that were that were difficult to write, and and some some scenes that um, you know in the writing I would have to put it away. And and just just go away and do something else because I just got too too deep into that headspace, and especially when you have you know your protagonist is is narrating in the first person and and she's she's mute and so she doesn't speak and and what the reader gets is this kind of interior um, stream of consciousness almost, uh, and it is difficult. It is difficult to write, uh, but I I don't you know I I always try and maintain a, a critical distance there, and and I always try to respect the 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 actual material realities that I'm trying to represent, and and respect the the fact that these are real material experiences. This is real pain real trauma and and i try not to slip into an over identification or an appropriation of that and i try to respect and maintain that distance as much as i can um it is difficult but i i think that we as writers you know we we feel compelled to tell these stories but at the same time we need to do it in an ethical and responsible way you know, and, and try as much as we can to to respect the distance between a representation and an actual lived experience. How long how long did it take you to write a book? The first draft I wrote it in four months, so it was quite fast. Yeah, I I mean I, I literally got this this voice in my head and she would not be quiet for the next four months. So I just, I had to get it all down. Uh, and then the editing process was another, uh, another year, I guess, or a year and a half, of just editing it. And, you know, with my editors, my agents, getting feedback, 
um, and just kind of, you know, putting it all together. Mm. Yeah. And did the story change over time? Did you know from the beginning how everything was going to um, mm. come out or, you know, did like the ending change um, as you wrote? Uh, no, I mean, I I don't outline my novels. I don't plan my novels, which is, it's it sounds scary when I say it, but and sometimes I'll look at it and I'll think, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, I don't I don't remember this, um, but but you know, I just I I I feel like if I'm not surprised in the writing, then the reader is not going to be surprised in the reading, and. And so I like to just let things develop and let things happen. You know, there's there's a character uh, that she befriends called Adam who lives across the way from her. And, you know, I initially thought he was just gonna be this, you know, lighthearted, you know, little sprinkle of comedy every now and again, but he's basically this sleazy guy that she looks down on. But in the course of writing it, he became so much more than that and he became, a deeper character, he became, you know, this very civic minded, you know, activist guy who reminds her of Khaled back home in Syria, her love interest. Uh, and she forms a very deep, meaningful relationship with him and he becomes quite pivotal for her character arc. And this is not something that I anticipated when I started writing. It's just something that happened organically as we went along um, in the story. Yeah, I too was surprised by Adam. I thought he would just always be the guy that we were looking at and judging. So yeah, it was interesting to see him all of a sudden begin to play such an important role. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's that's what I that's what I mean is that I, if I had had a set plan or a set idea from from the beginning, that might not have happened. But I like I like just going along with the voices and seeing what happens. Mm. What what has been their reception? Uh, so, I was very um, a bit. I was a bit surprised. When my work came out, and when it was published in the U.S. and it was published in Ghana. I'm from mm -hmm. Ghana. Mm -hmm. and it was just so interesting listening to the feedback from people in both places. Yeah. So, I, uh, what has um, what's the the uh, reception been like from like the various communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also people who are not Arab or from Syria who've read the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, this this is something that I was um that I was anticipating because it's it happened with, with my first novel. Um so the first novel came out here in the UK, uh and and the reception is different, you know, from people who are familiar with the context and who are familiar with the society. My first book is set in Kuwait, which is where I'm from. Uh, so they read it very differently because they're coming at it from a different perspective. And it's been the same with Silence as a Sense so far. Uh, the book's only been out a couple of weeks, but the response that I've gotten from, um, you know, journalists who have been working in the region, who have documented the uprisings, um, you know, fellow writers, readers who are familiar with the context, uh, the, the response has been so humbling and so positive and they've really received the novel in the spirit that it was intended, you know, and which is not to say that that other audience haven't, you know, the response has been positive overall, but as I said before, you know, um, the, the, an English speaking or a quote unquote Western audience tends to look at these narratives in a certain way, you know, and it's, it's something that reveals uh, certain truths, you know, monolithic truths about a, a certain community or a certain class of people, or they look at it as, you know, through the prism of politics and of the, of the politics of the war. Uh, but the people who are familiar with the context or who grew up in the region, they don't necessarily see that. They see, um, you know, they see more into her character, more into her struggles with memory, more into her specific context um, with her family and with her, her experiences um, back in her homeland. So the, re the reception is different. It's been positive overall, which I'm very happy about. 
Um, but it's interesting to see what different readers pick up for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, it's 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 just been so nice to see um, different ways that people respond. It's not have, have, you, have you seen like a, a stark difference? Oh yes, yes, yes. No. Um, I I think I've I've done a lot of events in the U.S. where people are like, "This is such a strange story. This is so unusual. This character is such an exaggeration." Yeah. And the people in Ghana would say, "Oh my goodness, this character reminds me of my neighbor." Yeah. <laughs> this story. Oh, yeah. This story could be like my sister's story. And this exact thing happened to my sister. Yeah. Like, anyway, I've I've totally enjoyed. I, I I I did not for some reason expect it. I don't know why I should have expected it. <laughs> it's just nice to see. Um, yeah. It's interesting for sure. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. Um. So you are your doctoral student and you work on Arab women's literature. Yes. And I was wondering, uh, how, was this book inspired by any any writers? And also, who are your favorite writers? <laughs> uh, it wasn't. No, uh, this this book uh, I started writing Silence in a sense two years before I started my doctoral program. Uh, so if anything, my PhD research has been informed by my creative writing, not the other way around. Mm. Uh, my creative writing has always been, uh, it always circles a theme of, of trauma. And the first novel was a very, um, it spoke about a very personal trauma and, and unacknowledged trauma and the, the notions of shame, that, that kind of shackle Arab Muslim women in many of, of these societies. Uh, and silence is a sense is obviously of a broader scope. So there's personal and political trauma. There's trauma on an individual scale, but then on a large collective scale. Uh, and these are things that, that I've always been interested in. And I've always been interested in the psychology of trauma and recovery in representation of trauma. What are the ethics of that representation? So you know, it seemed natural when I was gonna start my PhD and I knew I was gonna look at Arab literature. And when you read Arab literature, it's it's kind of impossible to miss the trauma. It's right there in your face, you know, whether, whether it's written by women or men, whether it's political or personal trauma, collective or individual, it's there. But uh, the literature has really been neglected by literary trauma theory and it hasn't been looked at through that lens and so, that's that's what I'm hoping to do with my research. Um, I I have a lot of um, you know there there's a lot of Arab writers that that uh, I'm inspired by you know both writing in Arabic as well as Anglophone writers like uh, Ahdaf Suwaif or Fadia Fakir. Um, in Arabic, one of my favorites is Ghada Saman. She's a Syrian writer who wrote very surreal, kind of supernatural uh, short stories. And so I think a lot of that kind of found its way when I was writing this book as well in, in the more surreal, nightmarish uh, memories that the, the protagonist has. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a part in Silence as a Sense that, that conveys the experience of a refugee in the back of a refrigerated truck and, and you know, when they, they've been smuggled across the borders um, in refrigerated trucks. And I wasn't, I wasn't consciously aware of this, but, but my supervisor brought it to my attention that it's re it has resonances with uh, Ghassan Kenafani's 1962 short story, Men in the Sun. And he's a, he's a very well-known Palestinian writer. And one of the most well-known short stories of his is, is Men in the Sun, where these Palestinian men are smuggled into Kuwait in the back of a water tank. And, and from the heat, they, they asphyxiate and die. Um, but there are, there are parallels there that I wasn't consciously aware of, but it, it just kind of, it's, you know, what you read is, is kind of the fuel tank for what you write at the end of the day. And, I, and those influences do make their way into your literature in, in one form or another, even if, if you're not consciously aware of it. Mm. And you've, you've kind of briefly touched on this in this response, but 
I mean, you've spoken about trauma as something that's reoccurring in literature. I mean, over the last decade, um, have you are you seeing any themes that um, mm -hmm. are frequently touched on in 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 Arab literature, especially literature by women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, my my research is looking at this literature as an archive of traumatic memory. So what I'm looking at is the way that women, Arab women writers are, are keeping this traumatic memory alive within the literature that they produce and how it's really um, transmitted across and through generations. And it's passed down as, as a kind of inheritance really. And so we see the same themes arising. We see the same, um, uh, personal traumas in terms of gender relations. We see it on on a political level in terms of, you know, whether you're you're looking at Hanana Sheikh's uh, novels about the Lebanese civil war, or, you know, you're looking at novels about revolutions in Egypt. It, we're telling the same story over and over, and we've been telling it for decades. Mm -hmm. So my research is kind of looking into the why of that and what is the function of, preserving that archive, which I guess in some ways I'm kind of uh, contributing to now, but, um, you know, just trying to mine that and see what the purpose of it might be. Well, I mean, we're so fortunate to have you and this research focus, because out of it, we get this amazing book. Um, <laughs> I could you. honestly go on for quite a bit, but I will stop because I know, um, there are people out there who might have questions. So Annie, I will hand it over to you. Hello, I was still muted. Um, yeah, everyone uh, who's watching, thanks for being here. Ask uh, your questions now in the comments if you have any. Um, I just wanted to let people know that um, I'm glad that Peace uh, spoke a little bit about her book uh, kind of came up naturally, but I just wanted to let people know that Peace also has a novel and it's called His Only Wife and it is available uh, wherever books are sold, but especially Majors and Quinn. So I put the link to the Majors and Quinn website um, listing that book as well as um, the page for Silence is a Sense. Those are in the comments if you want to take a look at those. Um, and this is last chance for questions. Um, well, I will just ask one of my own. So uh, I loved hearing uh, about your, um, how you, how you didn't want to like gloss the Arabic. Arabic. And I think, I think that is um, very important. And I, I really appreciate that when that happens in books. And I think it also, it's all about like trusting the reader too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, you sort of, mentioned like you know you don't like to think of an audience specifically mm -hmm. while you're writing um but now that you're done writing and the book is out there and you have made these decisions um who who do you see as as uh gravitating towards your books like who's mm -hmm. who do you find as your audience um that maybe did surprise you and did not surprise you so mm -hmm. far um, you know, I, it, it is true that I don't, I don't think about those things, but, you know, I always hope that the, the novel will find a wide audience. Um, and it, it seems to have, you know, so far it's, it's only been out a couple of weeks, but, but I've, I've already been getting messages from, you know, people back home, people over in the States, people in Canada, um, people, uh, all over the place and and you know i think that there's there's a universality i guess you know to literature that that is what we all strive for this idea that that it is for everyone and it's not written for a certain a certain readership and so often in the publishing industry there's only really one audience that the publishing industry cares about um, and, you know, it's an audience that we all know, you know, who this audience is. The audience looks like the publishing industry and the publishing industry, you know, there was, there was a, a very famous report that came out uh, last year that, that showed how little diversity is in the publishing industry. So it's no surprise that the audience that they tend to focus on 
is has the exact same makeup, but that's not the audience that I think of necessarily, you know, and I'm aware of a wider readership and I'm aware of a more diverse readership uh, by virtue of who I am, you know, because I know that there are readers out there like me who are bilingual Arabs and I want to write for them as well, you know, or because I grew up in Kuwait and Kuwait is, is quite a diverse society. And I know that there are Indian readers and there are Pakistani readers and there are Indonesian readers and Singaporean readers and, and South African readers and Zimbabwean readers. Like I, I know that, that these readers exist out there. And especially, you know, in the world that we live in now, it's so democratized, you know, with the internet and Instagram and all of that, your books do reach a wider audience than, than you know, what the publishing industry might have in its headlights. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, the, the people that might be in mind to be marketed to is maybe not the be all and end all of who is actually the book is getting to, which is really yeah. wonderful. I'm glad you are seeing that your audience is. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Yeah. Um, we just have a little note from Kurt here telling narratives and narrating truth. Your discussion, Layla and Peace, has really stimulated my brain to go deeper in the area that I had not considered as much and will from now on. So thank you. Thank you again, Kurt, for your um, words at the beginning. Um, if I don't see a question, so I will just remind everyone that uh, the website, majorsandquin.com, has books by both Layla and Peace, and uh, the video will remain available on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Thanks, everyone, for being here with us. Um, I hope you had a nice evening watching this wonderful conversation with these two writers. Layla, Peace, thank you so much for being here. Um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Peace, and thank you to me.